This is lecture 3F. We've been discussing electrochemistry and we've spent a good deal of time talking about a type of electrochemical cell called a galvanic cell. Those are electrochemical cells that produce an electric current from a chemical reaction. Today we're going to talk about a different type of electrochemical cell. We're going to talk about one called an electrolytic cell. It actually does the opposite. It's an electrochemical cell that uses electricity to produce a chemical reaction. Now, if you think back to the design of the galvanic cell, the galvanic cell had two separate containers with two different solutions. Each solution had an electrode in it. The electrodes were connected by a wire, and then the two solutions were connected by a salt bridge. If we look at the construction of an electrolytic cell, there's actually only one container. There's one liquid. Both electrodes are placed into this particular liquid, and then attached to the electrodes is a battery and the battery is the source of electricity. Essentially what we're doing is we're running electricity through the liquid and that's gonna cause an oxidation reduction reaction to take place. So if we imagine first that we have an electrolytic cell, we're passing an electric current through water, we have to determine what's gonna be oxidized and what's gonna be reduced. And to do that, we're gonna calculate the oxidation numbers of the elements in water. Water's a covalent compound. It really is not made of ions doesn't have any charged particles. So what we do is we assign the hydrogen and oxygen oxidation numbers, which are assigned or pretend charges. Generally, when you have a covalent compound, what we do is we take the element with the higher electronegativity, and in this case, it's oxygen, and we assign it a negative oxidation state because it's more electronegative, and we give it the oxidation state based upon its position on the periodic table and how many electrons it would naturally acquire to make an octet configuration. For oxygen, that would be two, so we're gonna assign it an oxidation number of negative two. The hydrogens will therefore have to be positive, and because molecules are neutral, if the O is negative two, each of the hydrogens have to be positive one. So once we've assigned the oxidation numbers, we can now predict what's gonna happen in terms of the reduction and the oxidation. Let's take the cathode electrode first. The cathode is the site of reduction. So that means that some element has to be reduced at the cathode and our only choices are hydrogen and oxygen. If you remember that reduction means an element's oxidation number goes down, the only element in water whose, el whose oxidation number can go down is the hydrogen. It can go down from positive one to zero. The oxygen is already at its lowest oxidation state of negative two. It can't go down to negative three or negative four. So what's happening is the hydrogens in water that have an oxidation state of positive one will turn into neutral hydrogen atoms that have an oxidation state of zero. And when it does that, those hydrogens will be diatomic. Now, I've got a hydrogen ion written here as the reactant, but in reality, water molecules are covalently bonded. I should write a water molecule that turns to H2. When you're dealing with the reduction, and we know it's the hydrogen that's actually undergoing the reduction, both hydrogens in the formula of water do not get reduced. Because, hydrogen, because water, reacts as if it were the formula hydrogen hydroxide. So I'm gonna write it that way. So when you do the reduction of water, you're trying to write the reaction for that. Write water as hydrogen hydroxide. It's that first hydrogen that's gonna wind up getting reduced from its oxidation state of positive one into elemental hydrogen, the H2 molecule, where the hydrogens are zero. Now, when you're balancing an oxidation or reduction half reaction, you first balance the element whose oxidation number is changing. And it's only the first hydrogen in the HOH that's changing and it's turning into two hydrogens on the product side. So we have to balance those hydrogens first. I'll put a two in front. So those first two hydrogens whose oxidation states are plus one are turning into a pair of hydrogens whose oxidation state is zero that bond together to form an H2 molecule. When that happens, the hydroxides that are left over now just float off into the solution. So once the first two hydrogens have been converted into hydrogen gas, the two hydroxides float off into the solution, they're a second product. The last step, once all the elements are balanced in a half reaction, is to balance the charge. And right now, the charge of the reactant is zero because water molecules are neutral. The charge of the products adds up to negative two. The molecule of hydrogen is neutral, but the hydroxides are negative one each, and there are two of them, so they make a charge of negative two on the product side. So this is not a balanced reaction yet because the charge isn't balanced. We have a negative two on the right, a zero on the left. So 
half reactions are always balanced by adding electrons and I will need two electrons to balance the charge. So now the charge on both the left and the right side is negative two. And this is the reaction that occurs at the cathode, that's the reduction. The anode, the other electrode, is where oxidation occurs. And when something is oxidized, that's when an element's oxidation number goes up. In the case of water, the only element whose oxidation number can go up is the oxygen. It's negative two, and it can go up to negative one, and then all the way up to zero, where you form elemental oxygen. Hydrogen can't go up. Hydrogen, when it loses one electron, is positive one. It can't lose any more. So really, there's no choice except the oxygen. So therefore, the oxygen in water must be getting turned into oxygen gas at the anode. So the O, which has a negative two charge in the water, is turning into oxygen molecules, which have a charge of zero, the charge is going up. And the way oxygen really exists in this beaker is as H2O molecules. So the H2O is gonna turn into O2. Now the oxygen's changing its oxidation state. We have to balance the element whose oxidation state is changing. So I have two O's on the product side. I need two O's on the reactant side. I need to put a two here. So when the two O's in water now turn into an O2, you have four hydrogens that are left over after the oxygens have reacted. Their charges are plus one. So that means the two water molecules will wind up releasing their, their remaining four hydrogen ions. Finally, to balance the charge, because we have a neutral molecules on the left side, the charge of the reactants is zero. We have a neutral molecule in O2 on the product side, but four positive one hydrogens. That makes the product side have a charge of positive four. So to make the reactant and product sides equal to each other in charge, I have to add four electrons to the product side. So now the reactant and product sides both equal zero. So we would predict that if you pass an electric current through water, you're gonna produce hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. The reaction of the cathode is going to be two electrons plus two water molecules yields hydrogen gas plus two hydroxides. And the reaction at the anode is going to be two water molecules turning into O2 plus four hydrogen ions plus four electrons. In all electrolytic cells, you're going to find that whatever the substance is in the liquid, the positive component is the one that's going to be reduced down to a charge of zero, and the negative component is going to be the one that's oxidized up to a charge of zero. Let's say now instead of a solution of water, we have an ionic solution of the compound MN. Now, ionic compounds are usually solids at room temperature, so this might be requiring us to heat this up to seven or eight or 900 degrees. I don't mean it's dissolved in water. I mean we have a salt, we've heated it up, and it's melted into essentially molten lava. And so if you have an ionic compound that's been melted, uh, you'll actually have floating around in there millions and millions of the metal ions and millions and millions of the non-metal ions. No water present. That's all that's there. So if we want to predict what reaction would occur if you pass an electric current through a molten form of an ionic compound made up of M positive ions and N minus ions, let's go through the possible reactions that take place of the cathode and the anode. So the cathode is where reduction is going to occur the oxidation number has to go down. So what's the only element that's oxidation number can go down? That would be the metal cation. So at the cathode, the cation is always gonna be reduced to its elemental form. So what would that reaction be? It would be M plus yields M zero. And in order to do that, this would have to gain one electron so that the charges on the reactant and product sides are equal to each other. So when you have an uh, electric current pass through a molten salt, it's the cation that's always gonna wind up being reduced. The anode is where oxidation is gonna occur and that's where the non-metal ion is gonna be oxidized up to its elemental state. So the anion at the anode is oxidized to its elemental state. So N minus will turn into N, which is neutral. And to balance the charge, you need to put one electron on the product side. So anytime you have a molten form of a salt, you should be able to predict the reaction that occurs at the cathode and the anode. Let's try a couple of examples. Let's say we pass an electricity through a molten solution of potassium fluoride. Notice the phase of it is liquid. That doesn't mean it's dissolved in water. That would be aqueous. It means that you've somehow turned this ionic compound into a liquid, probably because you've heated it up to a very high temperature. 
So just by looking at the formula, if you can see that the potassium is made up of plus, plus one potassium ions, F stands for negative one fluoride ions, then at the cathode, the positive potassium ion must be being reduced down to elemental potassium. K plus goes to K. And in order to balance the charge, you need one electron on the reactant side so that the charge of the reactants equals the charge of the product. At the anode, the non-metal ion is gonna wind up having its oxidation number go from its negative charge up to zero. So at the anode, the fluoride ion is gonna turn into elemental fluorine. Fluorine happens to be one of the seven diatomic non-metallic elements, so the F minus will turn into F2. In order to balance that, we'll need two F minuses going to F2. And then to balance the charge, we'll need to add two electrons to the product side so that the charges on the reactant and product sides are each negative two. If that makes sense, why don't you take a moment and see if you can predict the cathode and anode reaction so that would occur if you pass an electric current through molten sodium chloride. So at the cathode, you're gonna have reduction and it's always gonna be the cation that's gonna be reduced. The positive one sodium ion is gonna get reduced to elemental sodium. Na plus goes to Na. In order to balance the charge, you need to put one electron on the reactant side so that the charges of plus one and minus one add up to the charge of the sodium atom on the product side, which is zero. The anode is gonna be the, re, the oxidation of the anion, so the chloride is gonna be oxidized up to chlorine. Cl minus turns into Cl2 because it's a diatomic species. To balance that, it would be two Cl minus goes to Cl2, and to balance the charge, you're gonna to need to put two electrons on the product side. So if you pass an electric current through a molten material, these will be the reactions that are always gonna occur at the cathode and anode. It's the reduction of the metal ion to an elemental metal, and it's the oxidation, num oxidation of the anion up to its elemental nonmetal. Now, let's say we're gonna pass electricity through copper to bromide, and it says aqueous, so that means there's a solution. So now we have aqueous solutions. This gives us a couple of different possibilities as to what may happen. In, a, a, in an aqueous solution of copper to bromide, there will be copper two ions and bromide ions, and their oxidation numbers, or actually their actual charges, because this is an ionic compound, would be positive two and negative one. But because it's an aqueous solution, there's also water molecules in there, and the water molecules are made up of hydrogens and oxygens, and their oxidation numbers, as we calculated before, were plus one and minus two. So if you're gonna write the cathode reaction that has to be the reduction, we actually have two choices. It could be the copper ion being reduced down to elemental copper, or it could be the hydrogen ion being reduced down to elemental hydrogen. And almost every single time you pass an electric current through a water solution of a salt, it's the metal salt ion that winds up getting reduced. So it's not gonna be the hydrogen in the water, it's gonna be the copper positive two ion. That copper positive two ion will turn into copper metal. And then to balance the charge, we're gonna to need to add two electrons to the reactant side so that the charge on the reactant side equals the charge on the product side. For the anode, this has to be the oxidation. A charge has to go up. And once again, we have two choices. It could be the bromide ion from the salt that gets oxidized up to its elemental state of elemental bromine or it could be oxygen in water that gets oxidized up to its elemental state of elemental oxygen. Once again, when you have an ionic compound dissolved in water, almost every single time, it's gonna be the anion of the salt that's gonna wind up getting oxidized. So it's gonna be the bromide ion turning into elemental bromine, which happens to be Br2. So to balance that, it'd be two Br minus yields Br2. And then to balance the charge, we're gonna need two electrons on the product side, and look at that, I wrote my phases wrong on there. It should say two Br minus aqueous goes to Br2 liquid. So most of the time, that's what happens when you pass an electric current through a water solution of a compound. Here's another example. Let's say we have a hydrochloric acid solution. Well, what's in here? We'll have, because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid, you have hydrogen ions and chloride ions breaking apart, floating around separately, and their charges would be plus one and minus one. 
but because this is aqueous, you also have water in there. And so you have the hydrogens and oxygens in water whose charges are plus one and minus two. So when we try to predict what's gonna occur at the cathode and anode, we have the same situation as before and the answer is gonna be the same as before. The dissolved substance is almost always the substances that get oxidized and reduced. So it's not gonna be the water, it's gonna be the hydrogen ions and the chloride ions. And the reduction is gonna be the positive hydrogen ion from the HCl being reduced to hydrogen gas. And to balance it, be two H pluses yield H2. And to balance the charge, you need to put two electrons on the reactant side. For the anode, once again, it's the dissolved substance that's going to be changing its oxidation state, in this case, undergoing oxidation. So it'd be Cl minus turning into Cl2. To balance that, two Cl minuses go to Cl2. And to balance the charge, we'll need two electrons on the product side. So we've seen a couple of examples here of aqueous solutions and what is it that's been oxidized and reduced? Always the positive and negative components of the dissolved substance. Now, it's almost always that way. Let me show you when it's not. If we were going to ask the same question, what do you think we're going to get if we pass an electric current through a water solution of sodium chloride? In a solution of sodium chloride, you would have sodium ions and chloride ions whose oxidation numbers equal their charges. They would be plus one and minus one. And because it's aqueous, we also have water molecules who are composed of hydrogens and oxygens that have oxidation states of plus one and minus two. So at the cathode, for the reduction, we would imagine the sodium ion would be reduced to elemental sodium. That'd be Na plus goes to Na. And to balance the charge, we would need one electron on the left side. Now I want you to think back to Chem 1A. Have you ever seen sodium metal and water in the same container? What happens when sodium is in water? I think it blows up. So if we were to do this, we would not see the electrolytic cell blow up. That means this doesn't happen. This is an example where it's not the sodium that's going to get reduced, it's the hydrogen in the water that's going to get reduced instead. So the water molecule is going to turn into hydrogen gas. And remember, when it's water that's going to be reduced, we have to think of the water as HOH. And so if you think of it as HOH, the first hydrogen turns into H2. We'll need to have two water molecules in the balanced equation, and it'll release a pair of hydroxide ions. Now, why does this happen? Why is it not the sodium ion that turns into sodium metal? If we look up on handout six, the reduction potential for sodium ions plus an electron yields sodium, negative 2.71. If we look up the reduction potential for the hydrogen in water, that would be 2H2O plus two electrons yields H2 plus two OH minus. The voltage is negative 0.83. Which one of these reactions is more spontaneous? It's the one with the higher reduction of potential and negative 0.83 volts is higher the negative 2.71. Most of the time, the metal's reduction potential is gonna be a higher value. That's why it happens most of the time. But every once in a while, the water's reduction potential will be a little bit more towards the positive side, and therefore that reduction is gonna occur instead. So when you have an, a metal like sodium, that's a really reactive metal, it's gonna wind up having a very negative reduction potential. And so that's going to be the only exception to when the reduction that's going to occur is not going to be the metal ion in the dissolved substance. It's going to be the hydrogen in water. So the exception you'll need to know for um, electrolytic cells is that metals that you know would blow up in water, and what metals are so reactive they blow up in water? The alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, right, first column or calcium, strontium, barium, and radium from the second column, those guys are not reduced. It's the hydrogen and water that will be reduced instead. So the only time you will not have the positive ion that's dissolved in the water solution being reduced is if it's a metal that you know blows up in water because you don't form a metal and that blows up in water. So it's got to be the hydrogen gas produced at the cathode instead. At the anode, we would still have the oxidation of chloride Chloride can go from negative one up to zero. So Cl minus turns into Cl2. To balance it, it would be two Cl minuses go to Cl2. And to balance the charge, two electrons on the product side. So you just have to watch for reactions uh, for electrolytic cells 
in which the dissolved salt has a metal ion that is really, really reactive, and I've listed them here. They're only the alkali metal ions or calcium, strontium, barium, radium ions. Those guys are so reactive that their reduction potentials are less than waters, so they don't get reduced, and the water gets reduced instead. So with that in mind, let's try to predict what we're going to get if we're going to pass an electric current through a water solution of potassium fluoride. So in our electrolytic cell, we would have potassium ions and fluoride ions. Their charges or oxidation numbers are plus one and minus one. And because it's aqueous, we're also going to have water in there who's made up of hydrogens and oxygens whose oxidation states are plus one and minus two. So for the cathode reaction, we would go to the positive ion in the dissolved salt and go, oh, potassium ion is going to get reduced to potassium metal. And then you think for a minute and go, wait a second, is that one of those really reactive metals? Yes, it is. It's in the first column on the periodic table. So don't pick that. The potassium ion is not going to be reduced. The only other thing that can be reduced in here is the hydrogen and water. And so the cathode reaction is going to be waters plus electrons yielding hydrogen gas plus the two hydroxide ions. So well, again, why did this happen? It's always because the largest positive or the least negative potential will be the spontaneous reduction. And the reduction potential for water we saw before was negative 0.83 volts. Well, that's greater than the reduction potential for a potassium ion, which is negative 2.92 volts, or it's the water is actually greater than any other metal that would blow up in water. So if you know that exception, it's always gonna be the case that when you have an alkali metal or calcium, strontium, barium, or radium as the cation in your dissolved salt, it will not be reduced. The hydrogen and water will be reduced instead. At the anode, what oxidation are we going to have? Let's go to the anion in the dissolved salt, which is fluoride. Fluoride can go from a negative one charge up to zero. So F minus turns into F2. To balance it, two F minuses go to F2. And to balance the charge, two electrons would go on the product side of the oxidation half reaction. Let's try this. Let's say we pass an electricity through a water solution of silver nitrate. So in our picture on the right side, we're going to have separated silver ions and nitrate ions. The silver ion has a charge of positive one. The nitrate ion has a charge of negative one. And because it's an aqueous solution, we also have water in there whose components are composed of positive one hydrogens and negative two oxygens. So what are the reactions that are going to occur? Well, silver is the cation in the dissolved salt, so silver ions will be reduced to silver unless silver is a metal that blows up in water. And if you think silver is a metal that blows up in water, then don't ever wear any jewelry into the shower or the swimming pool or at the beach. That would be a big mistake. But you'd actually be all right because it's not a metal that blows up in water. So the cathode reaction will be a silver ion turning into silver metal. And then to balance the charge, you would need one electron on the reactant side to make the charge equal on the left and the right. Now, for the anode, what's going to wind up being oxidized? Well, the nitrate has a charge of negative one, but what gets oxidized are individual elements, not a polyatomic ion. So we have to look a little bit more closely at the nitrate ion itself. Let's calculate the oxidation numbers of the elements in nitrate. These are covalently bonded atoms, and when you have covalently bonded nonmetal atoms, whichever element has the higher electronegativity gets assigned the negative oxidation state. And oxygen is closer to the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table, which means it has a higher electronegativity than nitrogen, so the oxygens are going to get assigned an oxidation state of negative two. Now, how many oxygens are in the formula? Three of them. Negative two and negative two and negative two add up to negative six. So what does the nitrogen's oxidation number have to be? If it was a neutral molecule, it would be positive six, but because it's a polyatomic ion that has an overall charge of negative one, the nitrogen's oxidation number is going to be five. Why is that? Because five plus negative two plus negative two plus negative two has to add up to the charge of the polyatomic ion. Now, I want you to look at that oxidation state for nitrogen because this is really important. Nitrogen is in the fifth tall column on the periodic table. It has five valence electrons. So if it's positive five, that means it's lost all of its five valence electrons. So that means its oxidation number can't go any higher than five. So if, you're at an el if your element has its highest possible oxidation state, 
which means it's equal to its number of valence electrons, it cannot be oxidized. So you will find that if the negative ion in your dissolved salt is a polyatomic ion, almost always the element bonded to oxygen will be in its highest oxidation state. So polyatomic ions cannot usually be oxidized. So instead of the nitrate being oxidized, it's going to be the water that's oxidized, and that's going to be the oxygen in the water that's undergoing oxidation. So you have one exception for cations. The only cations that don't get reduced are the ones that blow up in water. And now you have one exception for anions. The only anions that don't get oxidized are polyatomic ions. And the reason is what we pointed out here probably the element in that polyatomic ion is in its highest oxidation state, it can't go any higher. So the only thing that winds up going higher is the oxygen in water. So the water molecules will have their oxygens turn into O2, release the four hydrogen ions, and then four electrons to balance that anode half reaction. Let's look at a water solution of sulfuric acid and try to predict what we're going to get if we pass electricity through this. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid. It will ionize completely. It mostly ionizes into hydrogens and sulfates. Uh, Ms. Lagai will disagree with me on that because she thinks there'll be bisulfates in there, but we'll just sort of ignore that for now. If we just assume complete ionization, we're going to get hydrogen ions, which are plus one, and sulfate ions, which are negative two. The Water is also in there because this is an aqueous solution, and as we've seen before, the hydrogens are plus one, the O's are negative two. So what's going to be the reaction that occurs at the cathode and anode when we pass an electric current through this solution? The cathode's where reduction occurs. So we would think that the positive component of the dissolved substance is going to reduce down to its elemental form. So that would be the hydrogen ions from the sulfuric acid reducing down to hydrogen gas. So H plus goes to H2. And to balance it, two H pluses go to H2. And then you add two electrons to the left side to balance that uh, reduction half reaction. This is no exception. Hydrogen is not a metal that blows up in water. So perfectly, the cation part of the dissolved substance gets reduced to its elemental form. The anode is going to be oxidation. And so we have in our solution a sulfate ion. So we have a polyatomic ion, and it turns out that the sulfur in the polyatomic ion is in its highest oxidation state. To understand that, you need to be able to do a couple things. First, can you figure out the oxidation number of sulfur in the sulfate ion? The O's are negative two each, negative two, negative two, negative two, negative two, add up to negative eight. So the sulfur has to be six, so that six plus negative eight adds up to its charge of negative two. So the sulfur is positive six in the sulfate ion. What column on the periodic table is sulfur in? It's in the sixth tall column. It has six valence electrons. If it loses its six valence electrons, its charge is positive six and it's maxed out. It can't go any higher than positive six. So this is a situation where because you have a polyatomic ion as your anion, it does not get oxidized. The oxygen in water is the only other thing that can, can get oxidized. And so the water is going to turn from the oxygens to negative two into O2 gas. The four hydrogen ions are released, and then the four electrons used to balance it. So that's how you predict products for electrolytic reactions. If we try one more, let's say we pass uh, electricity through a water solution of sodium carbonate. If you want to take a minute and see if you can predict the products and write the two balanced half reactions for this one, and then we'll go ahead and do that together. So this solution contains sodium ions whose charges are plus one, carbonate ions whose charges are negative two, and water molecules who have oxidation states of hydrogen and oxygen of plus one, minus two, respectively. At the cathode, we would expect the sodium ion to be reduced to sodium metal, except sodium is an alkali metal. It blows up in water. That will not react. So therefore, the hydrogen in water is what's going to be reduced. And that reaction is two H2Os plus two electrons yields H2 plus two OH minuses. And once again, how we figure that out is you write water as HOH. And so it's that first H turning into the H2 gas. You need a two in front of the HOH to balance the hydrogens. And that means two hydroxides wind up being released. At the anode, you would look at the negative ion of the dissolved substance to be oxidized. That's carbonate. 
but carbonate's a polyatomic ion. Polyatomic ions are almost never oxidized, and for this one, for good reason, the O's have oxidation states of negative two each. They're negative two, negative two, negative two. The carbon has to be positive four, so that four plus negative six add up to the carbonate's charge of negative two. If the carbon has an oxidation state of positive four in the ion, look on the periodic table, carbon is in the fourth tall column. It has four valence electrons. If it loses those four, that's its maximum oxidation state. So definitely the carbonate ion cannot be oxidized. So it has to go to the water and it's the oxygen component in water that winds up getting oxidized. So two H2Os turn into O2 gas, four hydrogen ions are released, and then you wind up having four electrons needed to balance the equation. So those are how you predict the cathode and anode half reactions in electrolytic cells. Now, what are electrolytic cells used for? Electrolytic cells are used for producing elements. If we have any sodium in our lab room, the way we get sodium is somebody has taken a molten sodium chloride, passed a current through that, sodium metal is plated right onto the cathode, and they've taken that and packaged it up. That's how a lot of very reactive elements are produced from electrolytic cells. Another use is for purifications of metals from ore, and probably the most common use is electroplating metals. If you wanna have something that's gold plated or silver plated or platinum plated, they actually use an electrolytic cell to do this. And back in the old days, when I, I, wanted, to get a, uh, I wanted to get my wedding ring plated platinum. And so I went to, where did I go? I went to the jewelry district in Los Angeles around Hill Street and 7th. And in there, they, you go into like the big buildings there and they have hundreds and hundreds of little stalls of jewelers and you go around till you find a jeweler you like. And if you, the jeweler's uh, giving you a price too much, you just walk away and then they, oh, come back. We'll get, take 5% off and you haggle with them. And then you walk away one more time. And if they eventually reduce the price as low as they can, then you go and I'll buy it if you pay the taxes and that's how you save your last 8%. So just some tips for you on shopping for jewelry in Los Angeles. But when I bought a ring there, I wanted to have it platinum plated. And so the guy said, okay, follow me. And we went out of the building across the street. It was a six story building across the street. We went up the elevator to the sixth floor and we elevator door opened. There were just doors all the way up and down the hallway. And we just walked all the way down. We got to some door and we walked in there and there was a guy just standing in there with a big old electrolytic cell and my jeweler said, I want this plated with platinum. And he had something all set to do that. So what he had is he had an electrolytic cell, had a battery on it, and he attached my ring to the cathode. Now the anode was made of platinum. So when they pass the electric current through that, let's think about what happens at the anode. That's oxidation. The oxidation number goes up. So the platinum goes from zero up to positive two. So you're causing the anode to actually decay away as the platinum atoms turn into platinum ions. And where do they go? They go into the liquid. So you have these platinum ions in the liquid. They're floating around. Now, what happens at the cathode? That's reduction. Well, the only thing to be reduced here are the platinum ions themselves. So the platinum ions, when they gain electrons from the cathode, stick right onto the ring and turn into platinum metal and you run it for 17 seconds or whatever it is, and you get a certain thickness of platinum, and there you go, 35 bucks, and you're out the door. So that's probably one of the most common uses for electrolytic cells. Now, quantitatively, we can actually predict how much chemical change takes place during an electrolytic cell by using what are called Faraday's laws of electrolysis. And there's two laws that Michael Faraday was able to develop to show quantitatively how uh, electricity that's passed through an electrolytic cell can be used to pr produce a certain amount of chemical change. And in fact, it was Faraday's laws of electrolysis that allowed chemists to eventually around 1900 figure out how many atoms are, there are in one mole of any substance. We've learned about moles and we've known about moles for a long time, but it wasn't until around 1900 that we knew a mole was actually 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms but it was actually Faraday's laws of electrolysis that allowed chemists to first calculate the numerical value of Avogadro's number. Of Faraday's two laws, here's number one. Passing the same quantity of electricity through a cell 
always leads to the same amount of chemical change. And then two, it takes 96,485 coulombs of electricity to deposit or liberate one mole of a substance that gains or loses one mole of electrons during the cell reaction. You've seen that number before, right? That's the Faraday constant. So 96,485 coulombs causes a reaction to take place in which something gains or loses one mole of electrons. So this amount of charge, 96,485 coulombs, is now known as a Faraday, and it's abbreviated by a script F in Michael Faraday's honor. Let me show you how we do a Faraday's law calculation. We're gonna calculate the mass of copper deposited by a current of 7.89 amperes flowing for 1.20 times 10 to the third seconds through a copper two nitrate solution. First step, what reaction do we need to know? It's either gonna be an oxidation half reaction or reduction half reaction. You don't need to know the complete balanced equation because something's produced at either the anode or the cathode and your question's probably gonna only talk about one of them. This says how much copper is deposited. So we're producing copper. What's it coming from? I guess the copper two nitrate, so the copper two ions. So the reaction you wanna write is the copper two ions, Cu2 plus, yielding Cu. That's balanced, copper on each side, but the charge is unbalanced, and that's the key. You've got to get the charge balanced here because the copper's positive two on the left side. You'll need to add two electrons to the left side to make the charge of the left side equal the charge of the right side. That's the key chemical equation for this problem. Here's how we start. Whenever you run a current through a solution, if you multiply the current, which in this case is 7.89 amps, by the amount of time that the current is flowing, which is 1.20 times 10 to the third seconds, if you multiply these together, you get amp seconds. And an amp second is the same thing as a coulomb. So by multiplying those together, you've now calculated how many coulombs of charge have passed through the electrolytic cell because one amp second is a coulomb. This allows amps and seconds to cancel out. Now we want to switch from the units of coulombs for charge into Faraday's. So what did a Faraday equal? A Faraday equaled 96,485 coulombs. So if I put the 96,485 coulombs on the bottom, the one Faraday on the top, I've now calculated how many Faraday's of charge have passed through the electrolytic cell, and that's important because one Faraday is resulting from one mole of electrons. So one Faraday is one mole of electrons. Now we use the half reaction we wrote above. What's the relationship between electrons and copper? It's two moles of electrons to make one mole of solid copper. So two moles of electrons on the bottom, one mole of copper on the top. We've just now calculated how many moles of copper will be produced. And if you want to know how many grams of copper are going to be produced, you want to switch moles into grams by using copper's molar mass. Mole on the bottom, 63.55 grams on the top, moles cancel out, and if you multiply all the way this through, you're gonna wind up getting a three significant figure number, and this electrolytic cell will have plated out 3.12 grams of copper, and it would actually would plate out on the cathode because the reaction we wrote is a reduction reaction, and reduction occurs at the cathode. Let's try again. Calculate the mass of aluminum deposited by a current of 5.00 amperes flowing for 10.0 minutes through an aluminum nitrate solution. So we need to know the cathode or anode reaction that's taking place that's gonna allow us to calculate how much aluminum is deposited. So where does the aluminum come from? It comes from the aluminum nitrate solution, which dissociates into aluminum positive three ions and nitrate ions. So the reaction is the aluminum positive three ions turning into elemental aluminum. To balance the charge, how many electrons do you have to put in that reaction? You gotta put three. So the aluminum positive three ions are gaining three electrons to turn into an aluminum atom. Perfect. So let's start our chain for our uh, Faraday law calculation. Start with the current that's being applied, which is 5.00 amps, and we wanna multiply by the number of seconds that the current's been running for. Now they told us 10 minutes, so I'm gonna have to convert that into seconds, and I do that by knowing that one minute equals 60 seconds. So now the minutes cancel out and I have amp seconds. 
and amp seconds are always important because amp seconds equal a coulomb. So I can make the amps cancel out and the seconds cancel out. I've now calculated the number of coulombs of charge that have passed through this electrolytic cell. Switching to a different unit of charge, Faraday, 96,485 coulombs is a Faraday. And a Faraday is important because a Faraday equals a mole of electrons. So one Faraday equals one mole of electrons. And now we can use our balanced equation. The relationship between electrons and aluminum is a three to one ratio. So three moles of electrons on the bottom, so the electrons will cancel out. One mole of aluminum on the top, and we now know how many moles of aluminum must be produced in this electrolytic cell. Use aluminum's molar mass, and you can calculate how many grams of aluminum will be produced. And the three significant figures, this comes out 0 0.280 grams of aluminum. Let's try this. Calculate the current needed to plate 0 0.150 grams of zinc onto an electrode in 60.0 seconds from a zinc acetate solution. So for the electrolytic cell, we need to know the reaction that's plating the zinc. Where does the zinc come from? It comes from the zinc acetate, which is made up of zinc positive two ions and acetate ions. So the reaction that we're gonna use in this particular electrolytic calculation is the zinc ion turning into zinc atoms and to balance the charge, we're gonna need two electrons. So we've got our reaction. Now to do the calculation, I do not have the amps and the seconds. In fact, in this case, we're trying to calculate the number of amps because it says calculate the current. But what they've done in this problem is they've given us how many grams of zinc plated. We're gonna do this calculation backwards. Let's see how that goes. Let's start with the 0 0.150 grams of zinc. What do we convert that into? Use its molar mass and convert it into moles. 65.38 grams of zinc on the bottom, mole of zinc on the top, so now we have moles of zinc. What should that be converted into? We use the balanced half reaction. One mole of zinc takes two moles of electrons to produce it. So one mole of zinc on the bottom, two moles of electrons on the top. What's a mole of electrons equivalent to? A mole of electrons is equivalent to a Faraday. Now we know how much charge has gone through the system. Can you switch it from Faraday's into another unit of charge? Yes, because one Faraday equals 96,485 coulombs. We now know how many coulombs there are. Now, what is a coulomb equal to? A coulomb equals an amp second. So I'm gonna multiply by one amp second over one coulomb so the coulombs cancel out and I now have the units of amp seconds. If I only want the units of amps, I gotta get rid of the seconds, so that means my last step is divide by the number of seconds that the current is run, and they said 60.0 seconds. So if you just divide by or multiply by the reciprocal of 60.0 seconds, the seconds will cancel out, and you'll calculate how many amps must have been going through this system, and that comes out to be 7.38 amps. If that makes sense, let's give you one more of these Faraday law calculations to try on your own. Calculate the time in minutes needed to deposit 0 0.400 grams of chromium from a chromium-3 nitrate solution with a current of 10.0 amperes. So in this case, the chromium is coming from the chromium-3 nitrate. The chromium-3 ions are turning to chromium atoms, and they need to gain three electrons in order to do that. This is your balanced half reaction. In this case, we're trying to find the time, so we're gonna to have to start with the 0 0.400 grams of chromium. First step, convert the mass of chromium into moles with chromium's molar mass. Second, use the balanced equation. One mole of chromium on the bottom, three moles of electrons on the top. We now know how many moles of electrons must have passed through the electrolytic cell. A mole of electrons is a Faraday's worth of charge and switching Faraday's into Coulombs, one Faraday is 96,485 Coulombs, and then a Coulomb is equivalent to an amp second, so this now gives us the units of amps times seconds. If we divide this by the number of amps that were used in this electrolytic cell, which is 10, the amps cancel out, and we now have the time in seconds. If they want it in seconds, you're done, but if they wanted the time in minutes, we'll do one more conversion, 60 seconds equals one minute, so 60 seconds on the bottom to cancel out, 
and we get a time of 3.71 minutes that that electrolytic cell must be used. Now, before we finish our chapter on electrochemistry, I want to talk about one final topic, and that is corrosion. Corrosion happens when we have things made up of metal, specifically iron. Iron's the major component of steel. We have a lot of things that are made of steel. And unfortunately, iron is an active enough metal that it oxidizes readily from its elemental form into positive two or positive three ions. If we think about why that would be or how it happens, iron turning into iron two ions plus two electrons is an oxidation and the oxidation potential is 0.41. It's a positive value. That's a spontaneous reaction. So iron is going to tend to naturally turn into iron two ions. But it's only going to do that if something's going to cause it to be oxidized. So something else has to be reduced. So what's present when iron gets oxidized? Well, it's oxygen in the air. And in fact, it's actually moist oxygen in the air. So you need oxygen and water present. If you have oxygen from the air and a little bit of water vapor, then the oxygen and the water vapor plus the electrons from the iron can turn those into a pair of hydroxides and that reduction potential is 0 0.40. If we figure out the overall reaction that occurs when iron undergoes oxidation, it's iron reacting with a half a mole of oxygen, one mole of water to turn into iron two ions plus two hydroxide ions and the potential for this is 0.81, which means it's a spontaneous process. So that's a problem. We have things made of iron. We have oxygen in our atmosphere and some amount of water vapor in our atmosphere. And so we actually will get this reaction to occur spontaneously. Now, we also make a lot of things out of aluminum. And aluminum can undergo the same type of reaction. Aluminum will turn into aluminum positive three ions in the presence of oxygen and water vapor and I won't do the two half reactions, but the overall reaction looks like this. The potential for this one is actually 1.71, which means it's way more spontaneous. Now, I'm sure you've seen pieces of iron rusted out before in your life, but I don't know if you've ever seen an aluminum can that's rusted out. And it should because it has a higher uh, potential than the iron does. So aluminum, will oxidize very rapidly to form aluminum three ions, which forms the compound Al2O3. It oxidizes, that's where the word oxidation came from. It forms oxides. So it happens very rapidly, but the aluminum oxide that's formed actually adheres very strongly to the aluminum metal itself. And it actually forms an entire protective coating on the aluminum. So the aluminum underneath it can't be exposed to the oxygen or the air and, or the uh, water vapor anymore and doesn't get oxidized. So if you have an aluminum can, which is sim symbolizes black here, the aluminum on the surface will very quickly form a very thin coating of aluminum oxide. And now all the aluminum is underneath the aluminum oxide. So oxygen, water vapor can't get to it. The can actually protects itself. So even though aluminum would corrode faster than iron does, because the oxide forms a protective coating, it actually doesn't corrode away. Now, iron oxidizes as well, but not as fast. It's not as a spontaneous process. And when it does, and it forms iron two or iron three ions, they actually combine with oxygen to form iron two oxide and iron three oxide. Iron three oxide, however, does not bond very strongly to the iron and it flakes off. When it flakes off, it exposes more iron, which oxidizes, and then that flakes off, et cetera, et cetera, and you wind up having rust created and the pitting out or the corrosion of any iron materials. So when a substance made of iron is actually uh, exposed to oxygen and air and turns into iron three oxide, you can see the iron three oxide in the picture here is not completely sealing off the iron. So that means oxygen and water can get to more iron, that will corrode, et cetera, et cetera. And then you wind up creating holes uh, in the uh, material that's eventually made of iron and eventually the iron will eventually all corrode away. So if we make a lot of things out of iron, we have to prevent it from corroding. So what do we do? To prevent iron corrosion, we do three things. One is we paint. Now, what does that do? Well, if you have something made of iron, like let's say the Golden Gate Bridge, and we don't want that to rust away because we really like it, we put a coating of paint on it. That's why it's that nice bright orangish red color. And in fact, they're constantly painting the Golden Gate Bridge 
and it takes them about a year to go from one end to the next. And once they painted it all the way across, then they start again and they're constantly trying to keep that iron coated so that the oxygen and the water vapor can't get to it. So that's one solution that's actually fairly cheap. Another solution is to layer it with tin. Now, most of the cans that you have, uh, things that you can, most cans at grocery stores that contain food material are made of aluminum now, but in the old days, uh, they used to be tin cans. You maybe heard that word before, tin can. Well, a tin can really isn't a tin can. Tin is actually really expensive. Tin cans were iron cans, but you can't have food in iron. It's gonna corrode away, and if it makes a little hole, bacteria gets in there, and you get botulism and die. So what they do is they coated the iron cans with tin, and so we call them tin cans. So what does the tin do? It acts just like paint. It just makes a complete seal on top of the iron so that oxygen and water vapor cannot attack it. But the one thing we learned when we were young, when there used to be tin cans in the grocery store, if you ever saw a can that had a dent in it, you never buy that can. Because if the can is dented, you get a crease and the crease can actually break the surface of the tin so the iron is exposed and you can have oxygen wear that away and then bacteria and stuff can eventually work its way in if you actually create a hole there. Now, if something breaks on that, like the can is creased, then that's when oxygen and water vapor attack the iron and then it corrodes away, so that's not so hot. The third way you can do it is you can actually layer the iron with zinc, and that is a name, we call that galvanizing. And if you go to Home Depot and you're buying a shovel or something, sometimes the shovels will say they're galvanized. So they're doing essentially the same thing by layering the iron with zinc instead of with tin, but the reason they're doing this is an electrochemical reason. If we look at the oxidation potential for iron, how readily iron gets oxidized, it has an oxidation potential of 0.41. Zinc is a more reactive metal than iron, and zinc's oxidation potential is 0.76. So if you uh, expose iron and zinc to oxygen and water vapor, which one of the two elements is gonna oxidize more readily? It's gonna be the zinc. So what happens when you galvanize uh, a piece of iron, like a shovel, with zinc, the zinc will oxidize instead of the iron. So the iron is prevented from being oxidized because zinc is more reactive. It gets oxidized instead. Now, did tin do that? Let's look at the oxidation potential for tin. Tin's oxidation potential is 0.41. So if you have something made of iron and tin, which would get oxidized? the iron would and it would corrode away. So tin only protects the iron because it's a coating much like paint. But zinc is an electrochemical protection because it actually gets oxidized more readily than iron, so it'll oxidize instead. So the tin only prevents iron from being oxidized by covering it. Z with zinc, the iron doesn't even need to be covered. In fact, you can have a piece of iron with a chunk of zinc stuck on it like this, and what'll happen is, the zinc will wind up oxidizing all completely away before any of the iron will. When that happens, we call that metal, in this case the zinc, a sacrificial metal. It's a metal that oxidizes more readily than another when the two are electrically connected. And so galvanizing causes that to happen. Most ships that sail in the ocean are made of iron and iron oxidizes really readily. And you don't want giant billion dollar ships to oxidize away and turn into something like this. So what people do when they uh, produce uh, large ships is they actually attach to the hulls of those ships magnesium blocks. Look at the oxidation potential of magnesium, 2.37 volts, really high, very spontaneous. So these magnesium blocks are attached to the hulls of ships and because magnesium is more reactive than iron, they oxidize instead of the iron, and they're easy, easy, more easily replaced after they've completely oxidized. And this is just the bottom of the hull of the ship that's being uh, uh, built in dry dock. And if you see all those little uh, white things that are attached to the red hull of the ship, those are blocks of magnesium. So when this eventually goes into the ocean, all those little magnesium blocks are gonna oxidize first, and then when they bring it back to port, whenever, half a year, a year later, they pull those off, they put new ones on, and it's way easier to replace those magnesium blocks than it is to replace an entire rusted out hull of a ship.
We've now completed all the material for test three, so let's go through the topics that you will need to know in preparation for the exam. First, for our thermodynamic chapter, you need to know the definition of internal energy, the definition of enthalpy, and then we calculate the change in enthalpy of a system or a chemical reaction. You need to know its meaning. In fact, the fact that it tells you a reaction is either exothermic or endothermic. I would like you to theoretically be able to calculate the change in enthalpy for a reaction by doing that from bond energies. Then we also talked about how we have a list of thermodynamic data that's found on handout five. And what's listed there are uh, enthalpy changes for formation reactions. You should know what a formation reaction is. And then from those standard heat of formations that are given on our thermodynamic table, I would like you to be able to calculate delta H naught from the tables of standard enthalpy of formations. We talked about a new thermodynamic property called entropy. You should know its definition. You should be able to predict the absolute entropies of various substances. And I would like you to know the meaning of the delta S or change in entropy of a system. It actually means whether a system is becoming more ordered or more disordered. And if I write a chemical reaction out for you, I would like you to be able to predict the entropy changes for the reaction, meaning whether they'll be positive or negative, just conceptually. And then I would like you to predict numerically the actual values of the entropy changes of reactions based upon the tables of absolute entropies uh, found on handout five. Then we discussed uh, thermodynamic laws. I would like you to know the first law of thermodynamics. I would like you to know the second law of thermodynamics. And I would like you to know the third law of thermodynamics. We then introduced the third and final um, thermodynamic property that I wanted you to know. So you should know the definition of free energy. We are going to calculate or we calculated changes in free energy for chemical reactions. So know what this means and it actually is telling you whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. And I want you to be able to calculate numerical value of delta G naught from tables of standard free energy of formations, our thermodynamic table found on handout five. You should also be able to do calculations based upon this relationship, delta G naught equals delta H naught minus T delta S naught. So if you know two of the three thermodynamic functions, you should be able to figure out the last one. And particularly for the free energy change, I want you to be able to discuss the contributions of delta H and delta S towards making a reaction spontaneous or not. We then talked about how delta H naught, delta S naught, and delta G naught are temperature dependent. Delta H naught, delta S naught are not dependent on temperature. They're always constant, but delta G naught does depend on temperature. So if you need to calculate these at temperatures other than 298, I would like you to be able to do that. We did a number of examples based upon that. We then learned how to calculate the free energy change of a reaction that's not under standard state conditions. And that's done with this expression, delta G equals delta G naught plus RT log of Q. And then we talked about the relationship between delta G, delta G naught, and the equilibrium constant. And I would like you to be able to calculate the equilibrium constant from delta G naught or calculate delta G naught from the equilibrium constant. And then finally, in one of our experiments, we talked about how you can determine the delta H naught and the delta S naught of a chemical reaction from a Van Hoff plat, uh, plot using Excel. And uh, we're gonna probably have you actually not use Excel to do that, but you'll probably have to make a graph, figure out the slope of the line, and from the slope and the intercept, calculate what delta H naught and delta S naught are for a particular chemical reaction. And that was our chapter on thermodynamics. For our chapter on electrochemistry, we talked about some definitions. First, charge is measured in coulombs. Electric current is measured in amperes. Electric potential is measured in volts. And then we introduced a way to make an oxidation reduction reaction occur so that electrons have to flow through a wire in order to make the reaction proceed. We call that arrangement a galvanic cell. I would like you to be able to draw a picture of a galvanic cell, label all the parts, show me where the electrons are moving, show me where the ions are moving, and uh, identify every component of that. Those include the anode, the cathode, and then the rest of it as well. We introduced you to handout six, which had a list of standard reduction potentials. A lot of reduction reactions were written and those reduction potentials were given there. I want you to be able to use those reduction potentials to predict strong oxidizing agents and reducing agents. 
from those reduction potentials. And then for a galvanic cell, I would like you to be able to determine the standard cell potential from the standard reduction potentials, determine the half reaction that occurs at the anode and the half reaction that occurs at the cathode, what the overall spontaneous reaction is for the galvanic cell, and be able to write me a line notation for a galvanic cell. For galvanic cells that are not under standard conditions, I would like you to be able to calculate the voltage of a non-standard cell from the Nernst equation, E equals E naught minus RT over NF natural log of Q. So from this, I want you to know the relationships between E, E naught, and the equilibrium constant, and that should allow you to be able to calculate an equilibrium constant from a standard voltage or a standard voltage from an equilibrium constant. And then we also talked about relationships between delta G naught, E naught, and the equilibrium constant. And I'd like you to be uh, familiar with those as well. And finally today, we talked about what electrolytic cells were. I would like you to be able to predict what the electrolysis process, uh, products are gonna be, be able to write me a balanced half reaction that occurs at, a, at the cathode and the anode in an electrolytic cell. And then you'll have to be able to do Faraday law calculations as we did today. And then we talked about process of corrosion and conceptual things about that. The experiments you need to look over are experiments 13 to 19. I want you to specifically know uh, things that happen in the qualitative analysis uh, experiments for groups two and three. Uh, each of the ion colors we had as a post-lab question in those labs, I want you to know those. Know the complex ions that can be created. And then of course you've read through the two chapters for this particular unit.